Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of the RSL Show. My name is Andy Munoz. I'm here with Alex Napolis and Joshua Clark. And Real Salt Lake is sitting number one in the Western Conference standings. Guys, how does it feel? Let's just go around real quick and talk about how this feels. Josh, I'll start with you. You know, I'm I'm still smiling from Saturday. It almost feels surreal, right? We haven't had this kind of... We've had exciting seasons, but this one just feels different. So it's a little surreal. That's how I'm feeling. Are you waking up like chipper these days, like better than normal? Oh, yeah. When your team's good and you're winning, life's, life's good. You're just driving the speed limit, getting to places when you get there. Yeah, not swearing at everyone for <laughs> driving too slow, taking too long to accelerate. You know, the road rage goes down for sure when RSL's better. That's good. Alex, what about you, man? How are you feeling lately? I'm right there with Josh. Um, feeling fantastic. It's awesome to wake up in the morning, look at the MLS standings, and see Real Salt Lake at the top. What a weird thing to say, huh? It doesn't happen often. Not for this happened. long. Usually no. it's like until match day is over and the game, the guys that were yeah. you know, still trying to finish their result then jump back on top. We have to screenshot it really quick before the results change the next day, right? <laughs> right. right. Uh, Rocky Mountain Rivals, if we can still call them that. It seems like the rivalry is back a little bit. There was a few scuffles. Uh, but yeah, Colorado coming to town. Looked like a packed uh, America First field. I got glimpses of the lineup. Uh, what did we think going into this match? Did we think that we were going to show up with a good squad and give it a full 90? Uh what were you what were you guys' feelings going into this one? I'm going to be honest and I was nervous. I was considering that the last time Real Salt Lake lost was to the Colorado Rapids at home. I was a little bit nervous coming to this one because I'm still on the fence like whether or not to believe this Colorado team, you know? Are they really as great as what they've been showing? And I think Saturday kind of answered that question for me. Well, and and also like you know, not to bring the salt factor back in, but it's like, is RSL as great as we think they are? So I was also extremely nervous. You can ask Mitch. I was, you know, leading up to the match, I was just, you know, I don't know how tonight's going to go. I'm scared. I don't want to lose the, as much as I say, I don't enjoy the Rocky Mountain Cup. I don't want to see Colorado win it, especially at America First Fields, right? So the, the nerves were there, but I still felt good. What are the stats behind the Rocky Mountain Cup? Is it 17 meetings and Colorado has only won three times? Is that right? Not not meetings, but cup seasons, right? It's we're like thirty wins, they're thirteen wins, maybe, and then there's some draws in there, some skewed number like that. But they're our little brother. It's weird that we have these uh, competitions that aren't really competitions that are actually recognized by the league. I mean, you watch the MLS streams, and they're all talking about the Rocky Mountain Cup. Uh, they're showing the trophy. Obviously, it's like a fandom uh, trophy that was created. I, I, if I'm right, Josh. You're looking You're correct. confused. Okay. That's how I remember this, and that's how I've always treated it. It's an exchange between uh, fans, but it looks like, obviously, it's just been with us almost the entire time that I've been supporting Real Salt Lake. Alex, that's probably the same for you. I mean, Josh, probably the same for you. The same for everybody. Uh, going into this one, the first half, man, it didn't look good. I remember texting you guys, and uh, we can get into that. So, Alex... I'm going to turn the time over to you, dude. <laughs> you're already shaking your head. Uh, you're not happy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, tell us. Um, let's let's go. Let's do a little brief recap of the first half. I mean, we have to start with Andrew Brody and that bad, bad turnover to Cole Bassett. And I want to give a little bit of credit to Cole Bassett because that guy watched film. He saw McMath have his high line. Because he, he didn't even think about it. He honestly just hit it straight to goal. So I, I want to give Basket a little bit of uh, a little bit of credit for it, but just a terrible, terrible, terrible giveaway from Andrew Brody. Would you, jumping ahead a little bit, would you say that Andrew Brody was kind of at fault for all three? Yeah. Yep. Yep. And we'll 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 break it down. But I think Andrew Brody had a big part to play in all three concession or concede all three goals conceded. Uh, in this one have I just not noticed that McMath is sitting so high off his line and so we see the turnover and we see the shot uh, again beautiful shot by Bassett um, obviously McMath isn't happy no one's happy at this point what are we thinking because this is scored 
in the fifth minute. Give me your reaction and, and then your outlook for the rest of the match, having seen that one go in. Uh, right after it happened, I said, oh, man, here we go again. And I thought it was going to be a I thought it was going to be a battle, obviously, to get back into it. But our, we've seen ourselves fall behind in games before this season and bounce back, have some comeback wins. So there was still optimism there, but it did suck to be down so early against Colorado. Yeah, I agree. I also thought, here we go again, right? Just kind of flashing back to some of the games last year, early red cards, early goals conceded. Um, But yeah, I was, you know, we're five minutes in, we have time. This will be fine. That that was my mindset there. I think in goal two, where Andrew Brody, I'm, this one's a little bit more unlucky, right? It's, you can't really predict where the bounce is going to go but at the same time like when you're learning when you're coming up as a defender you're learning the position you never go centrally you never 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 ever ever go centrally and what does Brody do he goes centrally and I I do want to give a little bit of maybe flack to Justin Glad because Glad should have done a better job vocalizing hey there is a guy running in do not go that way but Glad just kind of stops at the same time Brody kind of stops at the same time, and Navarro just absolutely takes uh, the opportunity and scores it over McMath. And a decent chip at that. I'll give him I'll give him some props on the chip. After this goal, I'm thinking, you've got to be expletive kidding me, right? We can't well, – what are we doing? We're, we're sitting in first place. We're riding high. We just beat up on Seattle. What is going on, right? Yeah. Just confused. But with how we were playing leading up to that, I remember looking at Mitch and going like, we're, we're still not out of this, right? We're, we're still going to be decent. We're, we still have a chance. So I was very annoyed, um, but also hopeful still, oddly enough. And me and Mitch talked about this at length during the game and after the game. But uh, I, I feel like the team around him is leveled up. And I feel like he may be having a hard time uh, keeping up, right? I, I'm a big fan of Brody. I like Brody, but he looks leggy. He looks indecisive. He looks unconfident, honestly. So I don't know what's going on with him, but this was a bad showing by Brody. I like Brody too, and I think he still does a lot for us going forward. But, I mean, we have to be – I think over the course of the last two years, we have to be honest that Brody just hasn't been the same player that – we saw that got him into the first team to begin with back in 2021 where he had that tremendous season and he just kind of slowly, I don't even want to say regressed. I think he's just plateaued and just has just kind of stuck there. We haven't really seen him kind of take that next step and everyone else around him is better. Yeah. So it kind of, it sticks out more in my opinion, but I like that point because yes, everybody is leveling up and then you've got Brody making Little mistakes, little deflections, leading to beautiful highlights for Major League Soccer to cut. That was a beautiful chip goal, by the way. It was. Guys, it was very nice. I know you guys said that, so great goals. Um, not even uh, a few minutes later, or yeah, a few minutes later, uh, Real Salt Lake gets back on the board uh, with Cristian Chicho Arango, which is amazing. Um, what was the reaction to that and um obviously it's 2-1 do we feel like we're back in this absolutely right it gives us some hope gives us some life right before halftime kind of you know towards towards the end of the first half but yeah it was great it was like chicho just did his thing another one for chicho you know we were looking good up to that point as well so yeah that just made you more excited going forward I think there's one player on the field that had an even worse game than Andrew Brody. And I think that's Zach Steffen because 110% Zach Steffen should have done better in this situation, needed to do better in this situation. And he just didn't, he just kind of pats the ball, gives it right back to Gomez. um, Ball gets kind of tangled up and then Chicho being Chicho kind of sniffs out the ball and is able to put it in. And like Josh said, gives you hope. Going forward, it's 2-1. It's a completely manageable scoreline. And when you have a guy like Arango, things are going to happen. Yeah. What's with uh, Colorado just taking, you know, U.S. national team goalkeepers and making them terrible? Stefan's having a horrible year. 
and I, I think Stefan has just completely taken himself out of the conversation of st- of goalkeeper for for the national team. Honestly, I don't I, doubt. There, it's been years since we've seen Stefan at a top top level, and I from what from what we've seen so far in Major League Soccer, obviously there was high hopes, but just from what we've seen so far this year, I don't know if Stefan will ever get back to that. Gotta love the press, the attack from Real Salt Lake on that. Usually deflections like that, easy cleared out. Uh, they're kicked away, but you've got Gomez right in Stefan's face, uh, trying to settle the ball. And then you've got Chicho smart enough and calm enough to just find it, uh, on the ground. And you can't even be upset. Obviously we'd be upset if it were to go over the bar. It, it looked like it took a pretty good deflection and luckily bounced in. But uh, loving what I'm seeing from Real Salt Lake, uh, Pablo was saying in the presser that he feels like this team's attitude uh, has shifted. He's seen a mental shift in leadership in the locker room amongst the players uh, that are eager to get back into the fight, eager to get basically back into the score sheet and uh, really put up a fight. Do you guys agree with with Pablo there? 100%. In the past, we've seen us give up a stupid goal or stupid card at the beginning of a game. And, you know, ships kind of sailed, right? So I think that's where a lot of people's anxiety comes from when, you know, we see some adversity in our first half like that. But this team time and time again this season has really showed that they're not going to stop playing and they're going to keep playing the RSL way until, you know, the final whistle blows. And and I think this was a, a statement win in a lot of ways for RSL. Not only did they beat a, a Western Conference contender at the t- at the moment, right? But they did it in a fashion that was just absolutely incredible. And I think too, I don't think Real Salt Lake started to play Real Salt Lake ball until they were down two nothing, which in the past, like you said, we it, we would have we wouldn't have seen that. But they really really turned it on right after that second Colorado goal, and I think that's what ultimately led to the Chicho goal, and what ultimately led to the beautiful goal that we're about to talk about. This next goal may have been my favorite goal of the evening, and I'm a little disappointed it wasn't up for goal of the week. Because, I mean, this thing, absolute beauty. Rocket. I, I've i lost my mind in the press box. <laughs> you don't expect a guy to volley it in the six-yard box like that, just outside of the six-yard box on the corner. Like It's just unbelievable, unbelievable skill and technique from Gomez here. The way that he set himself up for the volley before the ball was even in his – space before the ball was even coming near Gomez that's just incredible awareness for any player to have to just be ready for that situation to to have your your power loaded up and ready to go for when that ball does happen to come to you I'm sure Ralph like has worked um that set piece uh similar to that in the past or in training or whatever but Gomez absolutely worked it to perfection on that volley one of the the most beautiful goals uh we'll probably ever see from Real Salt Lake and, yeah. and the fact that he didn't put it over the bar. I mean, the, the amount of power he yeah. put on that to keep that thing down, just just incredible work from Gomez. And and that goal right there told all 20-something thousand fans in that stadium that night that RSL was, was going to win that game. I, I truly believe that. Like, that goal was so pretty and came at, at such a perfect time that that just, like, opened up the floodgates for the fans and the players. And I know there was still a little bit of adversity, but – I think that was a pivotal moment in the game. Yeah. Also, want to talk about his dance <laughs> Be- nomination for best dance ever. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this this it's got to be one that they practice because I'm looking at I'm looking back on it now, and uh, Gomez starts right in front of Stefan, so he's standing right in front of goal, and then as soon as uh, Luna takes the the kick he beelines it exactly to that spot. And I also noticed that Vera makes his run. Have they practiced that actual volley kick before? Probably not, but the situational awareness and then being able to rotate and get around to that. Cause it looks like he is a little bit late to it just to get his laces on it and put it through is just amazing. Uh, Are any of our goals up for nomination for goal of the week? Did you see RSL on there? No, Uh, I think one of Chicho's is really okay. Yeah. You guys know what to do. Go check that out. If you guys do see an RSL goal, make sure you're uh, retweeting or at least voting. Uh, Josh, what you pointed out, you felt like we were going to win this. I feel like a lot of fans are feeling that way. Why is the stadium and the fans so pumped? It's an electrifying state. I mean, I saw so much commentary on that 
saying that this is one of the loudest games, one of the loudest uh, crowds out there. Why do we think that is? I mean, just just the play of the boys Saturday night from McMath to the back line to uh, Anelli and Ojeda were absolutely incredible that night. I mean, probably the two best performances I've ever seen out of those two. You had Luna with one of his best displays, even though he didn't get any goals. I mean, he was bodying guys. He was making guys look silly. You had Gomez doing his thing. You know, first half Crooks looked pretty good in his interchange. First half. Um, and then you had Chicho Chicho in, right? So it was just a the performance was just inspiring. And, and soccer fans in Utah are smart, and they can appreciate that. And and they know where it leads, so I think I think that's a big part of it. How many years have we said that if we get an entertaining product on field, the crowd would change? Right? Wild, right? Wild. Yeah. And we're feeling it. We're seeing it. So we come back. It's two two draw at the half. Uh, we're still feeling pretty optimistic, feeling like we're going to get a result for Real Salt Lake. And in the fifty sixth minute, uh, we have. Ooh, how do you say his name? <laughs> Mihalovic. Mihalovic. Dorja? Dorja? Jo- Georgi Dorji. Mihalovic. In the 56th minute, we have Dorji Mihalovic. <laughs> uh, basically, put it up 3-2. And again, Josh, you had said that you feel like Brody was kind of on the end of these. And watching the replay back, it is comical uh, how this goal went in. Not a highlight goal. It's just pinging around in the box. McMath trying to get big, trying to get his hands up, and it goes into the net. So what do we think about this goal? I mean, McMath had two huge saves on this goal, two massive saves. Uh, Unfortunately, no one was back there to help him clean it up off the goal line. And, you know, Colorado was able to just kind of get a touch on it at the end there and get it in. Again, an ugly goal. I think all three of Colorado's goals were pretty ugly, right, in a lot of ways. They all stemmed from mistakes per se, but uh, this one was just a scrappy goal that you hate to concede. Um, And yes, was annoying, but again, still was like, you know what? We're playing very well. Not too worried about it. I think the thing that annoyed me most about this goal was the fact that our entire defense got caught ball watching after, after McMath stood on his head and made some two, made two very good saves. Um, Andrew Brody was the one closest to Mihalovic, which is why we were talking about Brody earlier. And I feel like it should have been Brody's awareness to box out or even do shield off, do something on Mihalovic to make sure that he didn't have that third rebound. But yeah, our defense just got caught ball watching uh, on that one for sure. Rare, rare defensive mistakes for ourselves this game. Very rare. Before we get into the fun half the back half of the Real Salt Lake goals. Who do we want to recognize? What are some performances that we want to recognize? We said what we had to about Brody. We can leave him alone now. Brody, just kind of get up to speed, dude. We still kind of believe in you, right? Do we still believe in Brody a little bit? I think sure. I think at this point, Brody Hidalgo, when healthy, is the starting right back. Okay, hot take. And, and I would not be upset if we explored in the transfer market other right backs. <laughs> Damn, another hot take. Go ahead, Alex. You got something else to say. Well, because I, th- I think we've raised the bar. We are, I think the, the way that team playing, the bar has been raised. And there's little things like that, like like position-wise, where if we get, if we bring in a guy who can kind of upgrade the starting 11 at those weaker positions, who knows what this team can do this year. Yeah, imagine a Katranis level guy coming in at right back. Deadly. Insane. Now, do you think like the front office or coaching staff feels that way, or do you feel like they'll just, you know, make do with what they got and just let Brody run amok? I think I think they're uh, they're smarter than they used to be. From what it sounds like, uh, Kurt Schmidt is not going to be shy to do some stuff in the summer. Mm, sure. He sat down with <laughs> he sat down with uh, DJ and PK a couple weeks ago, and he said, "Hey, we have the the room to improve, so we'll see what happens." Gotcha. Someone take Alex's press pass. I feel like you're you're going up to every single door and just putting your ear up to the <laughs> wooden door and then just blaming it on DJ and PK. <laughs> well, cool. Let's get into uh, breaks. Hang on. We just took more time to slam on Brody. <laughs> <laughs> 
let's go on the positive, guys. Who can we who can we point out? Uh, what are some either key moments, plays, or just uh, attitudes that we're seeing out of uh, players right now that is standing out, and that you guys are really happy that are here? I'll start. I'm gonna give. I already I already gave shouts out to Anelli and Ojeda, uh, but both of them and their hustle generated two of those goals scored th- for us off of just ridiculous shots that had they gone in on their own minds would have been lost, right? So not only have they had incredible performances in the midfield, but they're also helping contribute going forward. I was going to go with Ojeda because I think the position and the role that we wanted to play, it's a very dirty role. It's a very, you know, you're not going to pop up on the stat sheet, right? You're not going to get the contributions. You're not going to get the 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 crazy praise on the stat sheet. But be, because of the dirty work, because of what he supports on the attack, uh, Brian Ojeda has been very underrated this year. And honestly, he has cemented himself. Him and Anelli at this point are two of the best partnership or is one of the best partnerships in this league. There were rumors of Newcastle United scouts at the game on Saturday. Do you think they were looking at Ojeda? I'm going to say no. And that I maybe that comes from, you know, he was at Nottingham. He played in the championship. Didn't really get his chance there. So I don't know if not if Newcastle is a ready to make that move yet, you know? Sure. I, I personally think they're there looking at either a Gomez or a Luna, but maybe he's one of the goalkeepers as well. I've heard Beavers is linked with England all the time, so wow, who knows? That's Yeah, it's incredible. Before we move on to the fun part, as Andy said, I do want to pose this question to you guys because I've noticed that it's happening. Is it concerning that this summer window is very possible that people are looking at guys like Luna people are looking at guys like Gomez to potentially take him over because national media is all over Real Salt Lake at the moment media is outside of the United States like Southern American like Southern American media are all over Real Salt Lake at the moment so the exposure is there it's what we've always wanted though we want to be able to move players um, does it suck to lose them yes would you hope that you know we'll agree to sell them but when the season's over you would hope so um, but if if we can get millions for someone and then turn around and reinvest that money into another guy. We have to do it. The The question mark is because we've never been in this situation is ownership going to then turn and reinvest the money, right? That that's the big question mark for me. Uh, but if someone wants to offer us money for Luna and Gomez and it's a good chunk this summer, by all means. Cause it's specifically in the case of, of Gomez who in the last couple of weeks has really turned it on. He's having probably his best his best moment right now that he's ever had with uh with RSL. Um and there's, you know, eyes on him for Colombia. There's eyes on him for Copa America potentially is a possibility for Gomez. So he goes out to Copa America, does well at Copa America. Who's to say that a European club isn't watching, you know? I hope they are cuz honestly nothing feels better. Like it does suck to lose a guy, but it, it feels good to see like a guy you watched at RSL go kill it somewhere else. Do you, do they have the loyalty to stick around for a season? If that was the option, the end of a season and then take off. I don't see why not. I don't, they don't seem disgruntled here. You know, they have a good thing going. They, I imagine their competitors want to finish what they've started. So yeah. At the moment it's three, two we're behind Alex. Take it away. I believe this one starts off a corner kick route. So at this point, Rouse likes just berating attacks, just getting forward. I think Colorado at this point has kind of bunkered down, parked the bus a little bit. They're happy with the three, two. They want to walk away with the three points. Yeah. They Ours, brought in another center back. They brought in a boob. Yeah. Took off Mihailovic. Oh, that's right. Um, that's yeah. right. Um, at this point, Rouse likes just attack after attack after attack. Rochelle gets a corner. Balls whipped in, cleared out by Colorado, kept in well by Emeka and Nelly. And Nelly, who brings it down, volleys the hell out of the ball, comes off the crossbar, bounces off the head of Zach Steffen, takes a big bounce in front of goal. Chicho, who is shorter than Maxo and whatever other center back are, we're covering Arango, just basically out physicals them to jump up higher. And all of a sudden, it's 3 3. Chicho Rango should not be jumping over 6'5 Maxo like that. That's that's all I want to throw out there. What's Chicho's official vertical? Does anybody know? <laughs> we have we have to find out after that. <laughs> let me let me tell you, after that goal goes in, 
the the stadium was already a little bonkers, but uh, went bananas, absolute bananas. Um, and I, and I think that's when the the twenty plus thousand went from like rowdy to, uh, as I told some people, pandemonium. Really? Yeah, it was wild. This, I was gonna say this later or earlier, but I'll say it now. This may be the funnest game I've ever been to in my entire life. Ever? Uh, ever. Out of all? Out of all of them. Every sporting event? Soccer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. I was going to say. A lot of, that's a lot of real games, man. <laughs> this is, one had it all. <laughs> that is. That's a lot of RSL games. Dude, let's just come back, though. And Nelly's shot, dude. And Nelly, bro. When you when you watch the highlight or when you go back and watch that, obviously it's the Chicho goal. You know where the goal is coming from after everything's said and done. But you don't anticipate a Nelly to unleash a shot like that. I don't know That's where beautiful. he came from. I don't know what he's eating. I don't know what kind of regiment he's on. I don't know how often he's like working out. I don't know how many push-ups the guy does. He's just a freaking rock star, bro. I almost said like something else. It's wild that we went from a uh, Jasper Loffelson who we were like, wow, this is a insane draft pick. He's good. He's good to an Ellie who is 10 times the player Loffelson was. And that's no slide on Loffelson. An Ellie is insanely good. Good. It doesn't make sense, right? Played winger striker at Cornell. No one ever heard of the guy. Comes in, plays defense for us. Everyone falls in love with him. But then his sophomore season, the year you're supposed to slump, steps into the center of that midfield, cements himself as a starter, and and probably one of the best center midfielders in MLS. He did something that no one last year could do for Real Salt Lake, and that's fill in the boots of Pablo Ruiz. And I know I know he doesn't do the same as Pablo. I, I, he does more of like the destroyer role. But last season, we saw how much this team struggled struggled in the midfield without Pablo Ruiz. And this season, Amecanelli has stepped up in his injury and has pro- has made himself indisputable in that midfield. Yeah, hypothetical for Andy. If Ruiz was healthy and Anelli wasn't playing the way he is now, are we as good as we are? It's hard, right? Because you would look at everything else like the... The somewhat veteran status that he has, uh, the highlights that he's had, but it always felt like something was just hindering Real Salt Lake. And it's not to say that Pablo Ruiz was that, because he's obviously an excellent player, but sometimes it's the the small adjustments that aren't really in your control, because obviously if we had Pablo Ruiz healthy, like we probably wouldn't see this, but it makes you question, uh, would we be as good? Would we be as dangerous or more as dangerous. solid defensively know. right i think yeah. we're way more solid defensively because oh, yeah. of Anelli ojeda yeah absolutely it's a tough one honestly because for as much as ruiz gave you in the attack i still think there were some holes in his defense and sometimes we saw those holes when him and ojeda weren't on the same page i think towards the end before he got injured it started to look a lot a lot better and I don't know. That's a that's a tough one because I love Ruiz, but Emeka has just absolutely taken his his opportunity and ran with it. So another hypothetical: Ruiz gets cleared to play tomorrow and is a hundred percent good to go. What do you do, Coach? Would Pablo try putting him underneath Chicho as we saw early in the season? That's where I was headed. So yeah. yeah. Yep, I don't think he gets a spot back in the 6 or 8. I think he gets a spot at the 10. No, it's a good problem to have, honestly. It's an incredible yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fantastic. I mean, you just said it. The funnest game you've ever been to. I'm, I'm not even joking. You can ask Mitch how elated I was and how happy I was after this game. I just, I just haven't felt that feeling, that, that joy, that happiness from a soccer game. And I, I just couldn't tell you since when. It's just been so long to to see your team not only, you know, just put on this performance, but embarrass their rival and shut up the away fans and 
entertain you and make you frustrated. It was just, it was everything you wanted. And come from behind. Yes. Twice. Twice. I think that third goal eruption was phenomenal, but the eruption after the fourth goal bro, was even better. Let me tell you something. <laughs> that there was stadium-wide chance for Real Salt Lake. Ole, 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 Real Salt Lake. Loud, deafening. I'm like, I'm going to get my phone out. I'm going to record this. I want to remember this chant. I want to remember this feeling. So I'm recording the buildup. And what do you know? Gomez puts it in. And I throw my phone. And it's <laughs> up recording the celebration. But I got the goal from the press box. And it was just the best thing. But I did make a complete ass of myself up in the press box. I lost my damn mind. I celebrated so hard. So did everyone else. I didn't feel bad. But man, it felt so good. It felt so good. I heard strangers were hugging strangers in the stands. Absolutely. It was that kind of game, though. It was that kind of game that had so much excitement that you didn't care who you were sitting by. You were just pumped. Yeah, I had a I had a coworker go for the first time, and he texted me after, and he's like, dude. Now is is that if that's soccer, I'm in right. Like that's <laughs> a game to go to. How lucky are those people that they chose that game to be their first game, not for soccer, for RSL, whatever it is, whatever it was. Those people, I'm insanely jealous about because oh my god, bruh. You know how many games I've brought people to with their first game, and it's like a nil nil draw against Columbus <laughs> or something like horrible right so for that being your first game it's almost a curse because now your expectation is out of control right but man what a show you gotta watch isaac was recording uh behind the goal when that happened uh all his highlights are on the rsl show socials you can go check those out uh but the decibel levels on his camera was just insane so so loud and, uh, man, just happy for the way that this team is meshing. Obviously, the celebration leads into a dog pile, uh, which is just incredible. It's awesome to see this team that dialed in and just they're there for one another. It's awesome just to see everyone just in it. Somebody had emailed the show and said that Chicho's leadership qualities obviously was kind of centered around a scuffle. But if I had to just take a guess as to why this team is so unified and why this team is just, I mean, it feels like brothers on the pitch, like they're going to battle. They have each other's backs. I think it's one person and I think it's Chicho. You know, and and that's a crazy point you bring up because how often do you see a, a striker, an out and out goal scorer be the captain that holds the team together, the the locker room guy, the motivation guy. He's literally doing it all. You don't ever see that from strikers, I swear. Usually they're the you know, the selfish ones, the flashy ones, the the ones that want all the attention. I don't get that from Chicho at all. And then just real quick side note, that scuffle, the MVP of that scuffle was Vera, who lobbed in a three-pointer with the ball from about 20 yards away. Bounced off of one of Colorado players' heads. Absolutely incredible. Hilarious. Wouldn't be surprised if he got suspended. Uh, but yes, MVP of the scuffle was Vera. <laughs> I think that there's probably a lot of buy-in. Uh, when you have someone who is fresh off of a championship, who played with one of the best teams in Major League Soccer, LAFC, uh, who got to play with people like Vela, Gareth Bale, um, that that entire squad, like the squad that he won with was a really good squad. Goes to Mexico. I don't know if he was the leading goal scorer, but he was bagging goals. When you get somebody like that, that Real Salt Lake really hasn't had, at least recently. Ever. That's going to give Ever. you, that's going to get, like some ears are going to perk up. You're going to, A, you're going to give the respect. B, you're going to listen to what this person is saying. Because I'm sure Chicho has said at some points in the locker room or conversation to the team, this is what it takes to win a championship. This is what I observed. This is what I did. This is how the team meshed. This is how communication uh, was given, accepted, taken, received, heads down, let's go. I guarantee you those conversations have happened. And I bet there are a lot of moments like that that we don't know about, but I, I'm sure it's happening. 
Chicho was in that situation. Chicho was in that locker room. He knows what it takes to win. He knows what that culture is like. He knows what that environment is. And I truly, truly strongly believe that he has brought everything that he learned at LAFC to this locker room. And that is why we are seeing what we are seeing today. Bro, the days are gone of just bullshit. Remember how much bullshit we had with players in the news, local news, partying, gunshots fired. Going to uh, Vegas. Yeah. All of that just seems to, they're either doing a really good job at burying it deep and we're just unaware. But even with like our insider sources and, and the amount of time that we spend around the club, there's nothing like that happening. These guys are playing soccer. These guys are mature. You, you're not. You're not hearing about these inside, you know, locker feuds, right? Uh, think back to Ochoa. That's not happening. But I just think overall the presence and just the vibe and the culture. This team is here to play. This team is here to go far, and that's why we feel it. And I think that's why the the crowd. It's just everybody picks up on it. We pick up on it. We're talking less shit these days. I mean, granted, that's probably a given when you're number one, but culturally, damn, dude, this team is on it. And I think if you go back and listen to any of Pablo Mastroeni's conversations about Gomez and the surge that Gomez has had, he'll credit it to Chicho. Mm -hmm. He'll say that Chicho Rango sees him as a little brother. He's taken him under his wing, and Chicho has made Gomez this, you know, guy who was struggling to to get comfortable in this league, this guy who was struggling to find his footing in this league, a young guy who had never been out of Colombia before, and Chicho came in, made him his little brother, and now they we are seeing that pay dividends on the field, and it's amazing to watch. Even Palacio came in and had a good run for this match, right? Like He's had a rough stretch, so it seems like almost everyone is just really buying in. And again, I'll just love to see it. Everyone's happy. Uh, America First Field is buzzing. It's going insane. It's going crazy. Uh, how did that 90 plus six goal feel? Oh, boy, did that feel good. Just the icing on the cake. The the cream of wheat. I don't know what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> <laughs> but but to just see the dejection on Colorado's faces, right? They were just up 2-0. They were just up 3-2. They thought they had this Rocky Mountain Cup in the bag. Their fans were going wild. They were asked to not throw a beer at the end of the game when when they won the cup in celebration. Chris Armas is looking all smug like he should be in the next Fast and the Furious movie. Everyone's just excited on the Colorado end. And then bang, bang, goal four and five come in. And just the look on the Colorado Rapids' faces, priceless. Absolutely priceless. The joy in the stands, the roar of the crowd, the eruption of that ball hitting the back of the net. It's priceless, man. It's priceless. I've never heard you speak like this on a podcast. It's incredible. Alex, uh, walk us through that, man. Anderson Julio putting it away and uh, just just giving, a, giving us the fans and everybody what they want. Props to Nelson Palacio, who got his name on the assist sheet. For, you know, coming into this game, as we mentioned, Palacio had a good showing this time around. A lot better than New Mexico, a lot better than what we've seen from him over the course of the last couple of weeks. But Palacio wins the ball in the middle of the field. He immediately puts it forward to Julio. Julio decides to take it on all by himself, cuts in centrally from about mm, a couple yards outside of the 18. Just rifles it into uh, Stefan's bottom corner, hits the post, goes into the back of the net. And Chicho Arango is riding Julio. Um, giving him a piggyback ride. So, <laughs> would would you say this is the biggest gaff from Steph in this game? Because I feel like that ball was yes, it was a well hit ball, well placed, but I feel like Stefan should have had that. Yeah, look, like I said, man, if the Stefan had a bad game overall, the second goal he should have, or the first goal, obviously he shouldn't have batted it away right into Chicho's path. The Third goal, it's unlucky that it just comes off his back like that, but that fourth goal to get megged right in front of your box, it's poor. True, true. Absolutely poor from Stefan. And 
I think at this point, Stefan just wants to get out of there. Can't blame him. Yeah. <laughs> so overall, just an awesome result. Uh, do we want to spend some time on what's ahead on the next match or do we want to call it good? What are we feeling? Well, but before uh, Alex jumps into the next match, I, I think after what we saw Saturday, I'm going to have to make it a point to get out to Denver on the 20th. Going to have to, right? Mm-hmm. Quick day trip. Well, an overnighter, but leave Saturday morning, get to the match, stay overnight, come home. I think it's going to have to happen. So looking yeah. ahead for this RSL side, this weekend, it's going to be a matchup against the FC Dallas at Toyota Stadium. Oh, boy. Set for a 6.30 p.m. kickoff. Oh, boy. There's good news. There's some really, really good news. FC Dallas's first team squad will most likely be playing Wednesday, May 22nd in the U.S. Open Cup, which means that we're going to have a tired FC Dallas over the weekend. And and honestly, I don't want to jinx this match, right? It's always a hard match down in Dallas, but this is one of the weaker Dallas sides we've seen in years. A long time. So this is definitely another one of those. The guy's got to get out on the road and nab another three points. We have to do it. Yeah, because we're getting close. I mean, even though we're sitting, I, I don't know if we're comfortable. Uh, Not at seems all. Like, well, yeah, we're sitting a couple games ahead of who's next. Is it Minnesota? They have some yeah. games in hand, though. So, yeah. We just need to what? keep adding these points up. I will say this about FC Dallas. They start off the season with a win over San Jose, who is a basement dweller. And then they went seven straight games without a win. And their last two wins came to Houston Dynamo and Austin FC. So, I mean, getting better in the grand scheme of things. But sure. still the weakest Dallas side we've seen in a really long time. And and with the quality of opponents we have been playing, um, that this is kind of a welcome, a welcome sight, you know, yeah. kind of on the schedule. Plus, it's a way. It's on the road, and honestly, I like Ray also like on the road these days. Same. First, I don't know what happened. Whatever clicked last season has carried into this year. And we also like on the road has been so, so much better than we've seen in years past. So how are we feeling? What's the result? How's it going to go? And Josh, real quick, do you have any, any indications of trap games? I mean, Alex gave us a lot. It doesn't seem like it's going to be a threat, but are you still concerned? Um, You know, I'm always concerned because that's just my style. Uh, but I'm not feeling nervous or anxious for this one. So... Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. But you know, I, I do think RSL gets gets points here. I'm on the same train. I feel like, like I said, RSL. I've, I've I like RSL's chances better on the road than I have in years past. Any any indication of what Real Salt Lake has given me over the course of the last couple of weeks is that we're going to go into Dallas and we're going to we're going to be all right. We're going to have a three points to bring back to Salt Lake. Knock on wood, though, just in case. Okay. Yeah, I feel it, too. I feel like uh, unless for some reason the rug gets pulled under us and some people opt not to travel or they're being rested, I don't really see that happening. Then, yes, we should go in with the ultimate goal of getting three points and just attacking hard, playing hard, and just keeping this momentum up. It'd be a lot of fun to see another four or five goals match from Real Salt Lake. I think those three concessions that Real Salt Lake had against Colorado were just bad turnovers, easily fixable. Defensively, while it was ugly, I think we'll be all right. Catch us on the next episode of the RSL Show. We'll be back with that commentary. And if you want some really good breakfast, go check out Park Cafe. Open every single morning, weekends, weekdays. Say hi to Sean Miller. Let him know the RSL Show sent you for no additional discount. (laughs) 